the mic. Slides are there. Great. Don't have to look. Okay. Great. All right. Thanks. Um, Matt Reidenbach from the Virginia Coast Reserve. And so um, in terms of site news, we completed, completed our midterm site review um, in May 22, which was a bit delayed due to COVID. And we are currently working on a renewal proposal that is going to be due um, in spring of 2024. And the other site news, um, we've had um, our from our PI group two coastline and people uh, grants funded in the last two years, which is great. That is leveraging our site, um, a lot of the existing data um, from our site, as well as resources from our site to kind of further the, the COPE uh, projects as well. Uh, and our site is dominated. It's, it's a, a marine system that's located along the eastern shore of Virginia, and it's a very flat landscape that's uh, dominated by uh, barrier islands, coastal lagoon systems, and these tidal uh, mudflats and marshes. And what I want to talk about today is the, what we're working on in terms of spatial scaling, scaling in terms of oyster restoration and ecosystem state change. And first starting on the scale of the uh, restoration that we're doing on the reef scale and understanding how our restoration proce process and progress is affecting how that might be impacting um, how we do uh, think about oyster ecosystems and the functioning of ecosystems along the broader landscape within our system that is roughly 100 kilometers long, 10 kilometers wide along the um, uh, eastern shore of Virginia. And so a lot of this work can only really be possible because we have a very tight um, uh, a working relationship and a good working relationship with the Nature Conservancy, who over the last about 20 years has been undergoing um, restoration of uh, reef uh, well, that's weird. Huh? No, okay, got flipped somehow. Maybe a Mac to PC conversion. So, all right, well, the reefs are upside down, I guess. But yeah, <laughs> um, but yeah. So the um, the Nature Conservancy has been doing a lot of work on oyster restoration, and we've been working with them on the construction and monitoring over, say, the last twenty years. And we've been sampling seventy reef systems. And there's been a lot of challenges. We've had a lot of failures on these restoration sites. Um, but what we found pr predominantly is that there's uh, plenty of oyster larval supply, but what we, uh, for restoration to be successful, we need to create hard, stable substrate for these oyster larvae to attach and then grow. Um, and so we're monitoring both the, success, the successful sites and the failure sites of the restoration and comparing them to natural reef systems to understand, right, can these restored reefs recover lost ecological function and how much time is needed for this to happen? And if we kind of compare the years since restoration, as well as um, comparing the oyster density of the restored reefs to the reference reefs, we find that actually the restored reefs uh, match oyster densities after about a six year period and then start to actually surpass these uh, natural uh, reference reefs. Um, oyster sizes also gain to about um, equal to the reference site. And we also see temporal stability of these oyster, the biomass on these restored reefs to um, also match pretty well um, what reference reefs are um, after about that six year period. But what we do see is we either have like failures, like we don't get them to grow at all, or we actually have pretty good successes. Um, and so what we wanted to do then is say, okay, given that we have these 70 restoration sites and we have information about where these natural reefs exist, can we now start to scale up to the landscape scale and understand how restoration on the reef scale might be impacting um, larger scale? And can the suitability of the restoration sites be determined from known reef distributions? So this is where we started to work with remote sensing to try to do image classifications of where reefs are in the landscape, as well as um, habitat modeling of understanding not only elevations of these reefs, but where they exist in high wave energy environments, low wave energy. And what we found is um, the dominant predictor of whether we're gonna have a successful restoration or not is the elevation. So our reefs in our system really only survive and grow in a very tight elevation band between midwater level and about 0.8 meters below midwater level. And so doing restoration really is important in that area. And the second major criteria is citing them in a location that the the, the substrate isn't going to get buried by sediments. And so we have a lot of um, failures due to the right, not getting the right elevation or not getting a location where we're not getting that burial. And that is tied tightly to the wave climate and then the flow circulation patterns. And so by doing these modeling, then we can isolate where we expect to see good um, suitability for future restorations. And we have, since this coupling, we can have this um, information um, about whether the suitability that we've done in this model actually can predict better um, better habitat. And by going back and reserving these sites, we do find about a 1.5 times greater um, 
habitat biomass in these high suitable areas versus low suitable areas. So what we found is, right, there's plenty of larval supply in this area. It's getting that hard substrate. And so like many um, sites, uh, COVID hit and we were looking for uh, data sets that we could just uh, work on. And so one of our, um, our groups was looking at these larger meta-analysis of ecoservices associated with oyster restoration um, across um, lots of the coastal United States and looking at pairs restored and degraded reefs. And they too found that um, when oyster reefs uh, undergo restoration, they often match the um, a lot of the ecosystem services um, provided with restoration uh, compared to restoration reefs in terms of the production of oysters, the habitat provisioning and nutrient cycling. But one of the main challenges we found is that um, we often don't have good information about the failures. And so one of the big problems is, you know, these are these reported successes, um, but that doesn't tell us a lot about like where all the problems existed. And so we have a definitely a problem with publishing things that worked and not publishing things that don't work. And so if we want to make, especially in restoration, we have to have information about the problems and the failures to move forward um, effectively. So thank you.